Hey. Hello, everyone. If you are on Instagram, uh, maybe better come to come to YouTube uh, because I will not be able to read your comments. So it would be a standard room in YouTube. Um, it would be the first life, the fascinating evolution of Ashtanga Yoga in the modern era. Uh, maybe you can tell me, uh, hey, Raul, hello. Uh, can you hear me good? Can you uh, see me good? Here there is a storm right now. It started right now, it's crazy. Just at seven, it started. So I don't know how is the signal. But anyway, hi everyone. And uh, yeah. Hey, Agada. So, welcome to this live session prior to the masterclass, which will take place on the 31st, 31st of March at 7 pm. This will be a free online event where you will learn the three keys to warranty an effective Ashtanga practice without pain even if you don't know anything about the universal principles. And if you didn't register for the class, you can just go to my bio and click in the link. You can go to my bio in, uh, in the Instagram or I can leave you here in the comments. And uh, hey, Estela. So, Let's start. Let's see how this is working. I'm going to share screen. OK. Do you see the, the map there? Do you see when, what I am sharing? you put in the comments? So, yes, okay, super, super. Thank you, Stella. <laughs> okay, so let's start. <clears throat> the fascinating evolution of Ashtanga Yoga in the modern era. I'll put myself like this. So what's what's all of this? What's Ashtanga Yoga, you would say? So we have to make a difference between what is Ashtanga Yoga philosophy and what is the Ashtanga Vinyasa method. So in the Ashtanga Yoga philosophy, we've got here Patanjali, that he was a yogi a few thousand years ago. He wrote a book and um, is the highest, uh, let's say, authority on yoga. And he states what is yoga, uh, what is everything about of, of it. And, and this would be like a, more like a psychological, really, uh, treatise. And um, this uh, Ashtanga Yoga is Raya Yoga. So it's the king of the yogas and ashtanga yoga is the eight limbs of yoga so ashta it means eight in sanskrit and anga it means uh, limb or branch so when we are uh, talking about the ashtanga yoga philosophy it would be the eight limbs of yoga and of course the ashtanga vinyasa method as well it uh, it implies that you are practicing as well this the eight limbs. And so the eight limbs, they are here. They are yamas, niyamas, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. So yamas, they are, it would be uh, the ethics that you have with the rest of the people. So it would be more like 
normal uh, kind of rules that you follow and they are five and they are ahimsa which it would be be kind or don't uh, don't use violence satya that it would be truthful truthfulness so you say the truth Asteya, that it would be don't steal or ask before taking brahmacharya that it would be traditionally is translated as celibacy but it would be taking us be efficient with your energy uh, and aparigraha that it would be uh, non-greediness or take only what you need so and this would be the five yamas uh, this has nothing to do with religion but the yogis in those times they realized that if you follow these five precepts you will reach the state of yoga easier so this is why they focus on that because it's nothing to do with with religion or dogma but they realize that if you do these things you would feel better so next are the niyamas and they are uh, let's say like uh the what do you what do you do with yourself so the other it would be yamas they are more what you do with the others and this would be the niyamas it would be more like the ethics with yourself and it would be saucha be clean uh externally and internally so not only uh in the level of physical but mental cleaning so you get rid of trash in your head and you get rid of emotional trash things like that and of course physical cleaning uh santosha which would be be content which is a practice uh tapas and this would be translated as unbending intent so you really are developing your willpower uh Sva svayaya it would be self-study or study of the ancient texts and isvara pranidhanani or isvara pranidhana which would be surrender or acknowledgement of that there is you do as much as you can do um, and after that you surrender because you acknowledge that there is some higher force that you cannot control um and so you are just letting go you know once you do everything that you can do or is in your hands you just let go and surrender so the third of the limbs it would be asana which is the practice of postures which is what this yoga is famous for after we got pranayama which it would be literally the expansion of the prana which is the life force which is done by breathing techniques and after this first yama niyama asana and pranayama it will develop slowly in pratyahara which is the withdrawal of the senses which means to look inside you start to look inside more so you are having a self-reflective practice which you start to uh, focus on yourself towards inside when you start to focus towards inside you develop concentration and once you hold concentration for a long time you develop dhyana and this will lead to samadhi which it would be liberation by the end so this would be the eight limbs of yoga and now what it would be the stanga vinyasa method so it was it became famous through patavi joyce which was the teacher who who started to, uh, to teach all these people in the 70s well, he started before but 70s 80s 90s 2000 and it's a very strong and dynamic asana practice is hatha yoga so it's part of hatha yoga this some people 
mistake. Oh, this is Hatha, this is Astanga. Well, Hatha is part of Astanga and part of Raja Yoga. So Hatha Yoga is where we practice in this uh, physical practice. And it's based on Tristana, which is breath, posture, and Dristi, which is gazing point. And uh, this is uh, the system. So we unite, unify these three elements in order to practice. So, and it was Sri Patavi Joyce and Krishna Macharya, his own teacher. Uh, both together, they, de they developed this system based on the Yoga Karunta, which is supposedly a text which uh, nobody knows anything about this text. There is no proof. Mm, there is a little bit of a myth. But this regarding the myth, if it's true or not, it's a practice that works. Uh, it's becoming more and more uh, famous, this practice. And you know, more and more people, they are just uh, feeling these effects of of this practice and um, this is actually the proof so we don't need to to really prove uh, anything you know it does not have to be a text an ancient text for this no so this will be the first part now second part is the stanga sequence settled in a stone no, it's not settled in stone. It's a living tradition and needs to evolve. And if it doesn't evolve, it's a dead tradition. So it should evolve all the time and it's actually evolving. So it needs to suit the person. It should be supportive to everyone, you know, so you practice and it has to support your life. You shouldn't become a slave of the practice. Because if not, you get screwed. Only my years of practice have changed many things. So when I start to practice, there was many things that have changed since then, like number of sun salutations. B. I, when I started to practice, I was practicing five on five. Now they are five and three, I think. Uh, the number of breaths in the finishing positions as well, before they were more, uh, etc. There is many things that that have changed along the years. And before I start the practice, they have changed too as well. So adding or removal of positions. For example, there was no dropbacks or Urvadhanurasana in primary series. Uh, in the beginning, there was no lead class, only Mysore class, which it would be just self-practice. And there was no rule to continue with the sequence. So. And there was no rule, uh, you know, like you, as it says here, catch the heels in Kapotasana so you can move on. There was no such a thing. You do as much as you could do and sometimes you keep going, you know, even if you don't master the, the posture itself. So there was no such a military uh, kind of mindset. Uh, in the first years, Patavi Joyce adapted the practice to the student. And this later, it was impossible because there was so many people there that uh, they have to, you know, well, they didn't have to, but they did it like that. So, and they put this rule, what I was uh, talking here in this section here which this leads to question it is possible to transfer knowledge to big quantities of people you know is because when it became more saturated the place i feel that the people they were getting they were not getting the essence of the whole thing uh it's very different to practice with somebody that that was a senior teacher that was learning when there was not many people in the shala uh, and learning with somebody that came in the late, late 90s or early 2000s. Um, and yeah, they have a different mindset. And this was because this, because it was really overcrowded. So just a few years ago, 
this would be next part it would be the modern elements so how it's changing you know how it's evolving just a few years ago there was like a sacrilege or something like that you know for an ashtangi to use a blocks belt openers things like that so now it's a little bit more easier on some people there is still people that they are still thinking like that but but uh, there is already some people that they are kind of taking it easier you know if you want to take a block or if you want to take a belt just take it keep practicing so thanks god this is changing right and at the same time it's desirable to keep the rhythm and flow of the practice so we don't want neither to stop too much you know if we want to keep the rhythm but it's not a problem to stop for a moment you know you take your time to do something you know and as i say as i put here perhaps do some practices of exploration you can dedicate a practice to explore some aspects some aspects of the practice um better be flexible in the mind but don't attach to any so you don't want to uh, attach to any opener or to any you know to any blocks these are just help uh, to do whatever you want and after you have to get rid of it you know you, you want to just once you learn this uh, what you are using for these things you want to just keep going so if you need an opener to prepare for a posture just do it in the moment you don't need it just dismiss it and as well it depends how you use them you know it needs to have a purpose any of those you know a belt block an opener it needs a purpose depending on the person you can use them for ease into the post into the posture so to make the posture easier depending if this person is having a lot of trouble you know you can make it easier with this or you can prepare the posture like openers you can prepare the posture before entering because you are kind of tight in this part or whatever it is you know or you want to make the posture more difficult which is this is something that not many people is doing it which is another way to to work on the posture so you make it diffi difficult in order for later to have a contrast and once you have the contrast you you know you can if you first do it uh, more difficult later it becomes easier of course when once you don't have this thing you know? so it's, it's just common sense so what else we have here influences so here usually astangis don't care about alignment so much they usually they say you just do it practice practice and all is coming but i kind of have to disagree a little bit with this and uh, many of the times is because they don't understand the biomechanics or anatomy now it's slowly changing thanks god people they start to become more knowledgeable at least in anatomy you know they know how it's important to know how the body works because if you don't know how the body works this would lead to injuries and this is what we want to avoid you know we want to practice for life uh, this is something that it needs to be done you know for a long time uh, without a stop so if you want to have a sustainable practice you need to know about anatomy and biomechanics to avoid injuries farther down the line so great astanga teachers contributing and maintaining the yoga tradition alive with their creativity uh, there are more than these ones of course this i just only put three of them uh dina kinsberg which is my teacher uh, i consider my teacher um she kind of she likes to chant and she's putting a lot of chanting in her classes and nancy gilgoff which she passed away this last week and i never have the chance to practice with her but i know that she was teaching adapting to a student because she was taught like that she she was taught 
when she went to Patavi Joyce, she uh, Patavi adapt to her because she couldn't do vinyasa, she couldn't do many things. So she was teaching like she was taught. Amanju Joyce as well, which is the son of Patavi Joyce, which again I never have the pleasure to practice with him, but he knows how it was before because he was over there when he was a kid, you know. So he knows in the old times how it was. So he got a good imprint and a good, uh, he got the essence, I would say. And after great non-Ashtanga teachers, so teachers that they are not Ashtangis, but they are yoga teachers contributing and maintaining the yoga tradition alive with their creativity. And of course, there are many more, uh, but I put only three at the moment. And they are Iyengar, Mr. Iyengar, which he developed his famous Iyengar yoga. And uh, he developed different ways to practice. And this was out of his need because he was uh, a very uh, sick guy. And he was taught like that uh, in different ways. So he had to use his creativity uh, to to do a, a yoga which is kind of more therapeutical. Um, you are holding the postures longer. It's not as dynamic as a stanga, but it has as well many, many good things which I am getting inspired by. Uh, we've got Bandas Caravelli, which it was very interesting character. Um, she was a little bit of a for rebel and she didn't believe in any yoga institution or in any institution which uh, I agree with that and uh, she was the mentor of Donna Holman which is my other teacher so I have I consider Dina Kingsberg and Donna Holman my teachers so she introduced into yoga uh, aspects of martial arts Zen and shamanism, which I really, really resonate with that. And I find that it's really, really interesting and it's creating, it's enriching uh, the yoga, any yoga that you can practice. So this would be the influences. And now we've got here some tendencies. So I would divide this in in two main uh, points, which would be those that focus on the what and those that focus on how to practice. Those that focus on what to practice. Usually they are great asana practitioners. This is undeniable. Uh, they have a great body capability so they have good genes or whatever you want to call it, but their bodies, they are capable, very capable. And sometimes they are awful yoga teachers, not all the times, but I will explain why. Uh, as a practitioner, they are great, but sometimes as a yoga teachers, they are not as good. And why? And this is because they didn't face challenges, which is really important. And they have less resources from where to teach. If you didn't face challenges, you know, it's everything easy. You don't have any struggle. So just do it. You you don't really learn from it because you can do it easy. And they cannot empathize with people that are struggling. So if they see somebody that is struggling, they cannot, they are, you know, uh, thinking, okay, you know, you have to do it better, you know. I don't understand why you cannot do this thing. They cannot put themselves in the other shoes. It's difficult for them. And it's not always, of course, as I say here, it's not always and not all. But sometimes, you know, there is an archetype that is kind of fitting inside of this. They think that if you don't have good genetics, Ashtanga is not for you. So 
because they were not having problems, you know, and they were having good genetics. Well, the easiest way is like, okay, this is not for you. I don't know how to help you. You know, it's like, it's a little bit like that. And I believe that understanding is not necessary because um, they are focused more, since they don't have trouble uh, facing challenges, their main focus is more like into devotional, which is really good as well. It needs to be devotional as well, but um, there is a part that they are missing, which it would be the understanding, the going deep into the posture, the physical, you know, they, if you want to help other people as a teacher, you need to understand things. It's not only about practice, but it's how to transmit, how to understand the posture and after being able to transmit it or to help someone else, which they are not as capable as you are. So more, they tend to identify more with their bodies. So when you are focusing on what to practice, there is a tendency to identify with their own bodies, which make them slaves of the practice and of their own bodies and create suffering, therefore, which is actually counterproductive, counterproductive since the aim of the practice is to become free. The aim of the whole thing is to become free first in your mind. And later this will uh, permeate in your life. But first it needs to happen in the mind which you are from the step one not doing it so you are limiting yourself with this and this is something that is a pity but is there so they tend to identify with the practice so if you don't practice and i put here insert here your preferred part of the correct method so if you don't practice like this you are not an astangi if you don't uh, catch the heels in Kapotasana, you are not an Astangi. If you are not, you know, it's, it's very conditional, everything. And again, they are slaves of the picture they have about the practice, which creates suffering. And this makes them have, uh, when you, uh, when you are in this mindset, uh, you have a feeling of belonging, which you can have anyway, you know, like if you are practicing, you know, if you are focusing on the how as well, but uh, it's kind of more healthy uh, when you are focusing on the how. So this would be a feeling of belonging, like a clan. And this is what it's, uh, they are identifying with this. And they tend to shut down the critical thinking uh, in a stanga is like this, you don't do this, you don't do that, you know, very critical, uh, very non-critical, sorry, non-critical about like this, they don't question. And this becomes a sort of a dogma, which is again, no good, is enslavement for the mind. Um, so they are, uh, no questioning and, and they are in this authoritative mindset uh, because when you are focusing on what to practice the rest of the things they are not there is no room for that thing for those things right so it's a little bit narrow but it has uh, good things as well but somehow i tend to like or i tend to find more reasonable the focus on the how. Why? Because you care for the quality of the practice. Um, you usually come to the conclusion after experiencing and overcoming challenges. That is not what you practice, but how you practice it, which usually make them better yoga teachers. Because they have more resources from where to teach, because they can emphasize with the students' struggles, because they realize that understanding matters, because they believe you can practice basic asana in an advanced manner. This is something that is really powerful. And because they can apply the critical thinking 
be open to the outcome, whatever it is, and therefore less restraint in their own minds. And lastly, they tend to identify less with the practice and their own bodies, which makes them generally happier people. So this will be the tendencies. And now, to finish a conclusion, we saw what is Astanga Yoga, the eight limbs, the philosophy, and the Astanga Yoga of Patavi Joyce, uh, Astanga Vinyasa method, methodology. Uh, is the Astanga sequence settled in stone? No. Uh, new elements of yoga, modern elements, like, you know, thing, ways of, of trying to improve or trying to be efficient with your physical practice. Influences of teachers, and we were seeing as well tendencies uh, with a focus on how to practice and uh, what to practice. And I think uh, this would be more or less everything. I don't know if anyone has any question, just put it on the chat here. Uh, I don't know if if uh, you would like to ask anything about uh, what we've been doing. So this would be more or less everything. <clears throat> Everything okay? Cool. So we've been here already half an hour. Well, it took some time. Well, anyway, no questions. Thank you so much, everyone, to be here. And uh, see you tomorrow or any other day. Ciao, ciao.